I, I first became interested in literacy several years ago when I was asked by a publisher to write a, a book about technology for teachers. And I agreed, being extremely flattered, and started researching, started outlining, organizing what I wanted to say. And as I started reviewing my outline, I came to realize that what I was talking about, what I was wanting to talk about, was not technology, but information. That, that, that what has, has changed, that has impacted so, us so much, is the information that has resulted from these technological advances, but it's the information, perhaps, that we should be uh, concentrating on. So I talked them into changing the focus of the book from technology to, uh, to literacy. Uh, but there's another, there's another um, factor. I believe that's starting to drive this re-examination of what it is to be literate. It's the changing nature of information, but it's also, uh, I was, I was um, in Hong Kong a couple of years ago uh, working with a, a school, a series of schools, and frequently when I work with a school district, I'll volunteer to do an evening session with parents, because I think a lot of this uh, parents, the community, uh, needs to hear it as much as the educators. And I asked them a question, there are about 200 people in the audience, and these were international schools. Um, and, and I asked, how many of you are doing now what you went to college to learn to do? And six hands went up. You know, and, and everybody else, you know, they're doing something different. And, and it's like I said earlier in, in the presentation, uh, basically today you go to college to get your first job. And, and, and you have to utilize uh, skills in order to continue to learn, to continue to develop. And, and I would maintain that those are literacy skills, that, that, that literacy is no longer simply uh, for the sake of being able to read a newspaper or instructions at work, but today literacy is for the sake of being able to use your information environment to learn what you need to know to do what you need to do. Information has changed. Uh, uh, it's changed in what it looks like, what we look at to view it, uh, how you find it, where you go to find it, what we can do with it, uh, how you communicate it. Uh, uh, it has changed in three dramatic ways uh, that are, are, are totally new. It has become increasingly networked, digital, and abundant. And because it's networked, we have things like blogs and wikis and, and Twitter. Uh, we have an information environment now that bypasses editors, publishers, librarians, and really all that has given us comfort as educators. And, and uh, being littered today, because of this, because of this prevailing information environment that, that comes from us, uh, we have to expand our notions of what it means to be a reader. That is no longer simply can you read the text that somebody's handed to you, but it is can you can you resourcefully and habitually expose what is true in that information? And of course, uh, uh, true means a lot of things. Uh, often when I'm talking about literacy, I'll show uh, a, a website about Martin Luther King and then doing a little bit of uh, investigation, which is part of being literate today, is being able to investigate information environments. We discover that the website was created by a white supremacist group. So, so if I'm doing a report about uh, the civil rights movement, then that would not be an appropriate website to use. That would not be a true website to use. But if I'm doing a report on how propaganda is alive and well in America today, that becomes a true and appropriate website to use. So, so it, it's more complicated than just is this scholarly true? Has this, uh, has this been proven? Uh, information has, uh, has increasingly become digital. And this has an interesting effect on our information environment. When I was coming up, uh, the only information I was, I was taught to process was numbers in math class. Text was for reading, images were for looking at, video was for watching, animation was for watching, audio was for listening to. Today it's all made out of numbers. And for the same reason that, that children need to continue to learn how to add and subtract and count and measure and calculate and understand the language of numbers, it's become just as important that they learn how to process the numbers that are embedded in the text, in the images, that they were processing as a form of, electri uh, of uh, arithmetic today. Uh, being able to edit images uh, for a presentation or being able to edit images in order to uncover uh, information in that image that was obscured for, for whatever reason, that it's, that it's the ability today to resourcefully and habitually employ information by working the numbers that are not only on a piece of paper or in a spreadsheet, but that define our text, our images, our video, our animation. Uh, information is also uh, increasingly increasing. It's abundant, it's overwhelming. And, and I think we'll all agree that we are often overwhelmed by information, but that means that we have to work to decide what information we're, we're going to use, what information sources we're going to pay attention to, what information sources we're going to ignore. And that means that the information must compete for our attention. 
And if our children and we are to become effective communicators in today's information environment, we have to be able to produce messages that not only effectively convey an idea, but do so in a way that competes for the attention of our audience. So children need to learn how to write and how to write well. But it's, it's just as important that they learn how to communicate with images, how to communicate with sound, how to communicate with video, how to communicate with animation, how to produce a message that, that effectively uh, expresses an idea compellingly. And, and these three, I mean, I, I, I may have explained earlier, I've, I've been presenting all week and I'm forgetting where I said what, but uh, uh, essentially, you know, what I ended up doing in that book was respelling the three R's, that it's no longer, you know, just the ability to read, but it's the ability to expose what's true, to find the information, to decode the information, to, to evaluate, to find its value, to validate the information. That, that arithmetic expands into a range of skills involved in employing, uh, employing the information. That writing expands into a range of skills involved in expressing ideas compellingly. These are incredibly empowering literacies. And, and, uh, and I think that this, this is something that we have going for us, is that they're, they're, they're learning to become literate, not simply uh, to be literate, but it actually empowers them to do things that they weren't able to do before. And I think that, that this empowerment is something that must be, be practiced in the classroom, in education, outside of the classroom, that it needs to be a part of education, that they're practicing this empoweredness. Because if they're practicing this empoweredness, then we have to ask them to be able to defend what they're doing. Uh, 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 when they present a report, they need to be willing to defend the information that they're using. If they're creating uh, a, a PowerPoint presentation, they need to be able to defend the decisions that they made in the animation to put here or the image to put there. And, and if they are in, in the process of defending, continuing to defend their empowerment, then we have an opportunity to help them develop responsibility. And when children uh, learn and responsibility becomes a part of their use of information and of their interactions within information environments, then they become much more ethical users of the information. But I thought what I would do is just, just run through, jot down some, some characteristics, some things that, that I would expect to see in a school where contemporary or learning literacy is being practiced. First of all, I would see the, the, the distinction between teacher and learner blurring. Uh, I was in a school uh, about a year ago. I was uh, doing a, a walkthrough. The principal was taking me around. It's an, it's a, an amazing school in Philadelphia. Uh, many of the teachers are young, and, and I knew I was in a different kind of place when, as the principal was taking me around, people would come up and talk to him. And, and I often could not tell if the person who was talking to him was a teacher or a student. Okay, because they were all turning, talking about learning. They were all talking about the work of learning. And, and so this is a place where that distinction is blurring. Um, I would see uh, an environment that has become less reliant on textbooks. Uh, textbooks uh, have a place, they have a purpose, but the textbooks uh, do a good job of teaching students to assume the authority of the information that they've encountered. You know, that's the way I was taught. I was taught from, from textbooks, from authoritative teachers, from libraries, I was taught to assume the authority of the information that I, that I encountered, when what we need to be doing is teaching our students to prove the authority of the information that they've encountered. So, so I would want to see less reliance on textbooks. Uh, I would want to see less reliance on authority in, in the classroom, uh, 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 academic authority. And, and what I would want to see is more reliance on the work of learning. That, that as teachers are, are coming into the classroom, rather than using examples in the textbook that they've used for the last four years, that they're coming in with something that they found last night on the internet. Because that gives them an opportunity to say, I found this on the internet last night, and this is how I found it. And here are the questions that I asked as I was determining whether this was the appropriate information to bring in or not. You know, they are practicing those contemporary literacies, learning literacies, in front of the students. They are engaged in the, in the work of learning along with their students. Um, and another thing, and, I, and I, I had a hard time fitting this one in, but I think it's important. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I've, I've been watching for a couple of years on the internet is uh, infographics. How many of you know what I mean when I say infographics? 
Okay, and, and, and you know, they've been around forever, but because of, because of computers and the internet, uh, more people are, are, are able to make them, and uh, we're be able to distribute them to, to more people, and it's something that I've been promoting is, is, is uh, students being asked to take the, the material from a chapter or the material that they've, they've found in this research and express it as an infographic. And I think an interesting hap thing happens when they're asked to do this because there is a convergence between content. They're taking information from some area of interest, social studies, science, health, and they are using uh, uh, arithmetic, mathematics, to take that data and make it tell a story, and then they're using art or design to create that story, that page, that infographic, uh, and, and design it in such a way that the information communicates itself. So you've got this convergence between, between content areas, mathematics, and, uh, and art and design. When the teachers are doing the research and when the teachers are coming in with new material then, uh, that they've just found, then the teachers are, are teaching uh, from new learning. That was a term I was having trouble with. They're, they're teaching from their own new learning and they are teaching as master learners and as co-learners. Um, Another term, I was in a conference uh, last week in, or yesterday actually, in uh, Winnipeg, and there were a number of uh, presentations about digital footprint. And y'all know what I mean when I say digital footprint. It's, it's uh, you know, we used to be very concerned about students' behavior and the information they put on the internet, so we started talking about, you know, what should you put on the internet, what should you not put on the internet, and the focus has turned around to what should you be putting on the internet. You know, uh, uh, it, it is, what should your digital footprint look like? You know, what should your presence on the internet uh, look like? And, and so they're promoting the students developing and, and creating, but doing it in a responsible uh, way. And, 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 and what I think is interesting and, um, and potentially powerful about this is the fact that they're developing, they're enlarging their identity. You know, when they are cultivating a digital fo footprint, a presence on the internet, uh, they, it is enlarging their, their identity of who they are, what they are. And, and I would extend this to teachers. Teachers should also be cultivating a digital footprint uh, uh, that is available to the community. And in the development of these digital footprints, and we, we've talked about e-portfolios here uh, today, and there's a lot of talk about uh, e-portfolios, but I think, I think we need to expand what, what that is, that it's not just something that gets turned in or looked at at the end of the year, but that it's a continuing digital footprint. It's a continuing uh, representation or presence of that student, who they are, what they've learned, and, and where they've learned it. And, and with, all, with all of this, this, this uh, employing of information, uh, exposing of information, uh, uh, expressing ideas, production of information products, uh, I, I think a lot of this can happen in the library. Uh, you know, I, I don't, do you all have Kinko's? You know what I mean when I say Kinko's? See, that's what I think the library needs to become, is a Kinko's for kids. You know, this is where the kids go to work the information. This is where the kids go to access, expose the information. This is where they go to produce and communicate the information. And a library, uh, part of the job of the library is to express itself, is to mirror itself. We go to the library to learn about ourselves. And, and, and I would see a library becoming a, a repository, uh, including a collection not only of what has been purchased, but a collection of what students have produced. So you can go to a section of this library and you can look up movies that students have made in the past. You can look up music that students have made in the past. My app stopped working. <laughs> have, I already, have I been up here this long? I'm sorry. Um, right quickly, uh, teachers need to model learning and uh, uh, school leaders need to model learning. Teachers need to model learning. Schools need to teach the community. The, your school needs to be transparent in such a way that, that the community is not just seeing you know, education going on, but they're going to your school, its website, whatever, and it's learning from that. It is learning things that it didn't know. It's learning that their children are learning things that they didn't know. Um, we're, we're, we're no longer preparing our children for a predictable future. We no longer have a defined road that we're preparing them for, so we need to stop preparing them for, with wheels. If we can't predict their future, we need to prepare them with wings. We should no longer be gaining knowledge just to know. We need to be gaining knowledge to know where to start. Thank you.